On the day he died, Foster left his office at about 1 p.m. Foster's body was first discovered at 5.45 p.m. by a man known as Confidential Witness. Shortly after 6 p.m., Park Police and paramedics arrived on the scene. At 6.37 p.m., police at the scene knew that the body was that of White House official Vince Foster. But the Clinton administration says the White House was not notified until 8.30 p.m. It says the staff was not notified until after 9 and President Clinton was supposedly not told until after his first hour on CNN's Larry King Live program at 10 p.m. Perry says Dickey called between 7.30 and 8.30 Eastern. Dickey told the Senate Whitewater Committee she didn't learn of Foster's death until 10 p.m. and didn't call Perry until 10.30. So it was after, well after 10 o'clock. It was well at my best estimation that I called the governor's ranch was 10.30. Okay. Helen Dickey says that she called you at 10.30 at night, Eastern. That can't be. That's, there's no way. Um, when she called me, it was between 6.30 and 7.30 p.m. Arkansas time. And Perry and another trooper have signed sworn affidavits to that effect. Other persons Perry then called affirmed that it was early evening. White House phone records that could clear up the discrepancy have not been produced. But when Perry was questioned by the FBI, he got the distinct feeling that agents were trying to get him to say the calls came later. So you got a feeling that they were perhaps trying to steer your memory a certain direction. I think they were trying to get me to say that it was possible that I was wrong. Former U.S. Attorney Joseph DeGeneva says he's never doubted that Foster committed suicide. But what troubles him is the cover-up that began after Foster's death. It is obvious to me that the lengths to which people went after his death to deal with his office and to prevent people from the Justice Department getting in there leads any reasonable person to wonder aloud what was in there, why was it being uh, removed, what were the reasons for it, and who were they trying to protect. Robert and Ruddy says a government cover-up of the foster death carries grave implications for every American. It's not just an interesting unsolved mystery case. If our law enforcement agencies can be subordinated for political reasons, all of us in this country are threatened by that. Friends of Vincent Foster have said they wish the questioners would just let him rest in peace. But it doesn't appear that's going to happen until a few more of the questions about his death are answered. Dale Hurd, CBN News, in Fort Marcy Park in Northern Virginia. During this administration, not 10 years ago, it's a much more serious matter. And a few weeks ago, Special Prosecutor Kenneth Starr appointed a new deputy prosecutor with a background in homicide to, among other things, settle questions about the foster death. Starr's lead deputy prosecutor, Hickman Ewing, told the Memphis Commercial Appeal, quote, There remain questions about Foster's death. Was it murder? Was it suicide? Either way, why? Almost all of those questions have been generated by public documents. Documents ignored by the major media, even though they offer a treasure trove of contradictions and mysterious details. Details that caught the eye of an astute Texas accountant named Hugh Sprunt. Uh, I'm not a Republican. I'm not a Democrat. I don't consider myself a conservative or a liberal. But Sprunt helped bring attention to the case through his initial investigation. Whoever wrote these official reports, and there have been four on the foster death, uh, they must have expected no one to read the underlying investigative record because the disconnects are so fundamental. Sprunt marvels at all of the basic inconsistencies of the official investigation, including even the color of the gun found in Foster's hand. It doesn't take a color TV to see that the gun shown in this death scene photo is black. Then why do FBI documents suggest that Foster's wife Lisa was shown a silver gun as the death weapon? which she then confirms as her husband's. Lisa is not a gun person, but she knows her colors. Why did she say she thought the gun that killed her husband was this silver gun if the FBI presented her with the black gun at the beginning of the interview? It's, I've tried to reconcile that in my mind and come up with an innocent explanation, and I, have, I don't have one. The only conclusion that can be reached is that Mrs. Foster was shown a silver gun. Then there is the confused and sometimes panicky testimony of the Fairfax County EMS workers who found the body. One of the first on the scene, Richard Arthur, thinks that he saw a silver semi-automatic in Foster's hand. And during a 1994 deposition to the Council for the Senate Banking Committee, 
Arthur became upset when it appears he felt he was being railroaded into calling the death a suicide. Arthur to Senate Banking Committee Counsel Glenn Ivey. From what I saw, there's a question. Now, if I was to take you for your word, then fine, it could be a suicide. But I'm still saying there's a question because I didn't see all that. And if a man put a gun in his mouth and blew his head backwards, how did the gun get under his leg? How come he was laying perfectly straight? How come there was only blood going down the right side of his neck, down the right shoulder? Why not the left? Then the record shows that Arthur became so disturbed that his lawyer had to tell him to relax. Another Fairfax County EMS worker at the scene initially coded the death as a homicide, but all have been warned not to talk to the media about it. Vince Foster was a key figure in both Whitewater and in the firing of the White House travel office workers, the affair now called Travelgate. And questions still surround the White House cleanup operations that took place in his office the night he died. These are the White House alarm logs. They show who entered what offices and when. And they show that on the night of Foster's death, there's a mysterious entry into David Watkins and Patsy Thomason's office. Apparently a short time after Thomason logged in herself. It shows something called a MIG group. What is a MIG group? Pritchard got a fishy response from the Secret Service. They first told me it wasn't them. Then they got back to me and said, no, we were wrong, it is our group. Um, and they were doing an alarm check. Uh, and there's nothing sinister about it. And I said, well, what does it stand for? And he said, well, we can't tell you what it stands for, and it's classified anyway. Pritchard thinks MIG group stands for Maintenance and Installation Group, part of the technical division of the Secret Service persons who might be capable of disabling an alarm, shutting off a surveillance camera, or cracking a safe. We don't know if they met with Patsy Thomason or what was discussed, but we do know that later that evening, Foster's office was entered and files were removed, something the White House first tried to deny. And finally, there is the mysterious story of Mr. X. In 1993, Mr. X made a series of phone calls to Paul Rodriguez, now managing editor for Insight Magazine, sister publication of the Washington Times. Mr. X told Rodriguez that on July 20th, the day Foster died, he saw a man fitting Foster's description being carried through Fort Marcy Park by two well-dressed men. Mr. X told Rodriguez that the man, who appeared to be drunk, was carried from a car in the parking lot and into the woods. Mr. X said he saw the two men lie the third man down on his back in a spot that matches the location where Foster was found. Rodriguez says he doesn't know if Mr. X was telling the truth, but he knows this. Mr. X recounted details of the case that at the time were still secret. He also says that the man obviously feared for his life. I've dealt with a lot of uh, kooky individuals, um, given the types of stories I've worked on. But I detected a, a true fear. He called uh, just about a half dozen, maybe eight, nine times. By way of the sound, they were from payphones. Usually along highways, you could hear the big trucks. The man was very emotionally upset, very concerned for the safety of, of himself, concerned for the safety of his two children. Mr. X eventually stopped calling and has never been heard from again. He may be yet another piece to the puzzle of what really happened to Vincent W. Foster. The passage of time has not settled the many questions surrounding the Foster death. In fact, as time passes and more information is made available, the more questions there seem to be. What all this proves is that the Fisk report, the official um, ruling on Foster's death, uh, is a pack of lies. Pritchard and others vow that the Foster story is not going to go away. We will find out what happened. And when the public learns the full story, I think it will be um, devastating. Dale Hurd, CBN News.